Okay, so let me do a proper introduction. Um, so here we go. Brad Birkenfield, you are perhaps the most celebrated whistleblower in history. You just uncover uh, money, uh, hiding money. You just gave the U.S. Treasury $15 billion in recovered assets, and you got awarded $104 million by the IRS. And now you just published a book called Lucifer's Banker, the untold story of how I destroy Swiss bank secrecy. Brad, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me, Alain. It's a pleasure. Two little things I want to correct. The amount that I brought back to the U.S. government has now been $25 billion U.S. dollars. Wow. And the new, the new version of my book, the first version was called Lucifer's Banker, How I Destroyed Swiss Bank Secrecy in 2016. This month, at the end of this month, the new book is called Lucifer's Banker Uncensored. And right. you may be asking the question, why republish the book? Well, the book gets into a lot of those details, and I'll give you some of the facts of why this book is revised with new content, new photographs, new documents, new quotes, and it's very, very powerful that happened over the last four years since the first book came out. You are living in Malta right now, but let me ask you, being that you, there's so much money involved and that you uncover, I mean, people from all stages in government and, and celebrities, don't you fear a little bit for your life? I don't, because I'm quite uh, um, a careful and cautious person and I have a very secure home here with uh, security and staff. But more than that, what I uncovered were people, this was over 12 years ago, you have to remember, Alain, and this were people like possibly your uncle or my father or people of this nature. So 12 years onward, most of these people want these stories to go away. These were just very wealthy Americans who were hiding money from the tax man or from a spouse or from their business partner. This wasn't the Russian cartel or a drug cartel or something of that nature. So again, it took a lot of courage to do what I did. This was the largest bank in the world, UBS. And what I exposed was the largest and longest running tax scandal in the world. We had 19,000 clients with $20 billion. This was just one bank in Switzerland out of 135 at the time. Brad, can we go a little bit back in history and can you tell us how do you get in banking in the first place? When you were going to school, I mean, is that what you wanted to do or, or and you know? Sure. That's a very good question, Ella. Um, my father is a retired neurosurgeon in Boston and my mother was a nurse and a housewife. Uh, my mom has since passed, but my father's still alive and he raised three young boys and I was the youngest of three. So we had a good education. We went to uh, good schools, played sports and so forth. Uh, certainly love ice hockey between the Montreal Canadiens and the Boston Bruins. That's a great rivalry. I, I cherish that. But um, so I was educated in a way to do the right thing and to work hard. My father had money, but he wouldn't just give us money. He taught us the value of money and the value of hard work and education. And I think that was instilled in all of three of us, my two brothers and I. So when I got into college, I started to study economics, and I got a job in the summer times at a very prestigious bank in Boston called State Street Bank. And that's really how my career started, and I talk about it in my book. It's quite a, an interesting um, ride that the reader will see with me going from State Street Bank in Boston to getting my master's uh, in Switzerland and then working for some of the biggest banks in the world, Credit Suisse, Barclays, and UBS. Right. So, so you started working for UBS while you were living in Switzerland. Is that right? That's correct. That was the last bank I worked for. I started with Credit Suisse in 1996. Then I went over to um, Barclays Bank in Geneva. And then from Barclays, I was headhunted to UBS, where I got a very uh, good compensation package. And I, I discussed that in my book. It's quite an interesting story. Right. Okay. So, um, Brad, I mean... Uh, I mean, you probably knew this being a banker, and I think almost everybody in the world knows that there are secrecy laws in all these countries, and the reason for those secrecy laws is to for to allow people to hide money. So, uh, 
weren't you right from the start a little bit apprehensive of working for one of these banks? No, because it's important for your audience to understand, Ala, that bank secrecy in Switzerland was there for a reason. And it made a good reason at the very beginning during World War II when the Third Reich came to power, the Nazis, and they were there to try and help people hide their money so that the Nazis could not come and take the money. Unfortunately, the Swiss played both sides of that fence. But we have attorney-client privilege, we have medical privilege, we have clergy privilege, and we have banking privilege. The problem with many of those is they've been violated for the wrong reasons. Certainly the Catholic Church, we know the stories there that they have violated, certainly um, the sexual abuse scandal. Certainly the banking secrecy has been abused for nefarious and illegal businesses. Medical privilege and legal privilege, well, that's certainly there, and that's generally good because you're helping an individual with that. Right. But the bank secrecy was something that was abused by Switzerland. Doing banking in Switzerland was legal, meaning you could hide money without paying tax. The problem was, was when my colleagues and I would travel to the U.S., and we would go to Canada to visit existing or potential clients, we were not licensed to do that business. So if we weren't licensed, then that is a problem. Meaning the problem is, is that you're breaking the laws of the, of the country, whether it's Canada or the United States. Okay, but it is of course well known that uh, the secret, I mean, there is uh, Cayman Islands, Singapore, Switzerland, Nevis, Belize, Delaware, Puerto Rico, all these places, that's what they advertise. This is what we are in business for. We are, we uh, portray to be decent citizens of the world, but our real business is to take hush money and to keep our mouth shut. Well, that's exa you're exactly correct. And you, as long, along with your audience, must be furious to the fact that they pay taxes, why are the rich people allowed to get away with this in these jurisdictions? But I can tell you, Switzerland has been ultimately exposed and destroyed thanks to my historic whistleblowing. The Cayman Islands is finished, Bermuda is finished, the Channel Islands are finished, and so on and so forth. There's wow. very few today that you can go and hide money. And the problem, one of the, country, one of the places you named is very important because we have a presidential election in America coming up. It's the state of Delaware where Joe Biden's from. The problem there is Joe Biden has been a senator for 40 years and vice president for eight years, and he's done nothing to correct Delaware. It's one of the largest tax havens in the world for money laundering. And my question is, when I expose UBS and Barack Obama and Joe Biden covered it up, and you may say, well, how do you know they covered it up? Well, because when you read my book, my new book, you'll see I had two private meetings with Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. And right. he shared information with me that proves that it was a cover-up by Barack Obama, Joe Biden, and Hillary Clinton. Wow, okay, amazing. Okay, so then you get this job, and then you start working for the bank. So tell us what happened uh, when you talk to your supervisor and try to tell him, you know, like, this is not legal. What happened then? Well, what happened was um, we, I had a colleague of mine bring me a document that he found on our intranet, our internal computer system. And I asked him where he got such a document. It was a three-page document. That document is in my book as well. The document contradicted the work we were doing by traveling to U.S. and Canada to market for clients and existing clients. And I said, show me on the computer system where you found this three-page memorandum. And he showed it to me. And then I made a copy and put it in my briefcase. And then I went to my boss. I said, what is this? This is ridiculous. You're actually putting us all at risk not just myself and my colleagues, but the clients and the shareholders of the bank. This is very serious. They, he told me not to worry about it, and I almost got in a fight with him in his office. I was very candid about this. I was very angry because he was lying to me and all of these people that I just mentioned. So I immediately went to my uh, computer and sent it to the head of my legal department and the head of my compliance department, two different people. I did that, and I got no answer. And then I did it again the next month. I got no answer. I did it a third time and I got no answer. Now, Alain, I'm a director of the bank. I manage $450 million for clients. Why won't you answer me? That's when I knew 
<laughs> it was a fix. And I, I, I removed documents from the bank, which were mine. I didn't steal anything. I took things that were given to me to prove what I'm going to say. As I'm telling you right now and to your audience in Canada and around the world, this was a scandal of the greatest proportions. Not just Canada, not just the U.S., every single country in the world UBS would market to. Japan, Australia, South Africa, Nigeria, Brazil, Argentina, and so forth. So you can imagine, in essence, this is a global criminal cartel. And I had to say, I don't want to be a part of this. What we did in Switzerland was legal. But what we did here, that was illegal, and I'm not going to get involved in that. So I stepped out, and I resigned from the bank. And can you tell us, uh, walk us through the process of uh, UBS getting clients from Canada and the U.S.? I mean, how, uh, how was that process? Well, this is what I tried to help Canada, and in my book I talk about it. You have a justice uh, enforcement officer by the name of Gordon Borgard, and, and it, I mentioned him in my book, and Canadian uh, citizens should be furious about this gentleman because he is deeply ingrained with corruption. He did not do his job. He lied to the Canadian citizens. I brought this information to them. I told them about Canada had over $5 billion dollars in offshore money in Switzerland at UBS. The U.S. had $20 billion, but yet you only have 30 million people in your country. We have 350 million. So you, per capita, Canada, had much greater offshore money just at UBS. Now, remember, that's one bank out of 135, Alan. There were many other banks that had money for Canadians. So why didn't Canada call for an investigation? Why didn't they indict any bankers? Why didn't they make any fines to make the taxpayers whole? And the reason why is the Canadian government is deeply corrupt. And at the time of the investigation, when I gave all this information, and I'll be happy to give it to you and we can have another interview, the names of the bankers, who would travel there, what parts of the country they would go from, from Quebec to Montreal to Toronto to Vancouver. And it was a team in Zurich and Geneva that went every quarter to your country to market existing clients. And then existing clients would help them get potential clients. And then UBS in Canada would refer clients back to Switzerland, which is highly illegal. And the Canadian government did nothing. And how this marketing would take place? Uh, you would go to a business owner and say, hey, you want to hide your money? Come with me or here's my business card. What was the process? Well, the process was very sophisticated. It's a very good question. And we also were given a training memo when we would travel to Canada, how to avoid detection at customs in Canada. I mean, wow. this was a global bank telling us how to break the law. So at that point, I never went to Canada. I only went to the U.S., but this was really quite amazing. And those documents are on, on my, uh, in my book and on my website. But we had the onshore business of UBS. The banks there in Canada would refer existing clients. That was one way. The other way is we would attend high-profile events. We would go to a Montreal Canadiens hockey game, and we would be in a luxury box there at the Forum uh, or the new uh, center now. I think it's called the Molson Center. Sorry. And, uh, or we would go to... Uh, um, a Formula One race in Montreal, or a hockey game in Toronto, Vancouver, or a wine tasting, or whatever it might be. And by mingling with very wealthy, affluent people, they'd say, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm a banker in Switzerland. And you could see that the clients would come <laughs> automatically to want to do business. Wow, okay. Okay, so yeah, that, that all makes sense. And okay, so let's say uh, the owner of... Um, of a car wash uh, business here who uh, who wants to take some money from Canada to Switzerland, how will he go about, uh, about to do that? Well, there were several ways that clients would hide their money in Switzerland. For instance, you might have a client who has a son or daughter that goes to school in London, and he would open an account in London, and then from London, he would then move the money to Switzerland. That's one way he could do it. You have a family member in university. The second way is you do business offshore. For instance, maybe someone is in the hotel business and he sells his hotels to a company in, say, Poland or Hungary. And the price is, say, 25 million Canadian dollars. He only brings back 10 million to Canada and 15 goes to Switzerland. So they right. do fake invoicing and, they, and it's, it's invisible. It's impossible to see because you show a contract, which is fake, of course. 
you show an invoice, which is fake, of course, and the money gets split. Right. And of course, this is still going on every day in spite of being uncovered and in spite of having all these new laws and treaties with countries. We all know that this is happening every day. It's business as usual. Even a UBS bank is still happening. Well, through my sources, I heard that the Canadian business in Geneva and Zurich was moved to Singapore and to Monaco so that they could say they could deny the fact that they have those accounts in Switzerland. The Canadian government and your prime minister, Mr. Trudeau, has no courage and he has no guts. Right now, I challenge your your uh, prime minister to come forward and to do the right thing and to say, we want to investigate UBS for the criminal conduct in our country for decades. Why? Because in 2009, as I talk about in my book, Susan MacArthur was appointed by the CRA, the Canadian Revenue Authority. Now you might say, well, that's great. Susan MacArthur, that's fabulous. She's the head of this. The problem was she was sitting on the board of UBS Canada at the time. So how could she possibly investigate UBS in, in Canada when she had a conflict of interest? The CRA <laughs> should have known this. Canada should have known this. But yet the Canadian citizens all got cheated. You got cheated. And all of your audience got cheated. 30 million Canadians got cheated thanks to the CRA.